play success through the power of play. And the worst advice that I've ever received is that you can only play when your work is done. Ooh, you can only play when your work is done. Well, well, your book is done. So can we play now, Gary? Or why is that such bad advice, man? Yeah, so uh, it, it was advice that was given to me from my dad. Uh, and when I was younger, yeah, it made sense. You know, I, I was that rambunctious kid that was like, I don't want to do homework. He's like, look. I know you want to play. I totally get it. I want I want to play too, but you got to get your work done. And so like, again, that helped me when I was a kid. But when I became an adult, that was like my mantra. And I don't know about you, but my to-do list is usually the the length of a CVS receipt. If you have CVS yes! uh, you know, in your area, like you oh, know how long you. those are? And so at, at that rate, I will never play because the work is never going to be done. Um, and, you know, that is one of the reasons... <laughs> Why I experienced so much burnout was that that voice was in my head like, hey, you can't play yet, Gary. You haven't deserved it. You know, you haven't earned it. So. Yeah, that's interesting, right? We hold us back from doing what we enjoy because work is this nasty four letter word that we have to do, that we fight, 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 fight. And then we're like, I'm tired. I don't have time. So so what's the alternative to that, though, man? I mean, don't we have to work all the time? I mean, how, how do we how do we make this work, Gary? I agree. Work, uh, work is something that, yeah, that we need to do, but play is also something that we also need to do and they can coexist. Uh, so like, don't like, and I talk about this in my book about how play can have multiple facets. Uh, most people, you know, they probably from expressing themselves and, and being their playful selves as a child, they probably got into trouble. I know I did. And so then it's been conditioned in us that, Hey, that is a bad thing. When you get that impulse, don't do it. And so, like, now we're just, like, as an adult, like, Ugh, I got to – like, we, we even say it. I'm chained to my desk. Well, like, we have all these negative connotations. And so, yeah, we, we you know, we want to play, but we see play as, uh, like, a frivolous thing. However, if you change the way that you see play, instead of seeing it as, oh, something only kids do or, or as a frivolous activity, see it as a potential power-up, as a way to energize yourself. And if that's the case – if you can change the way that you see it, um, I don't know who, what wise person said it, it wasn't me, um, but it was like, uh, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And so by by me sort of changing my perspective on play and seeing it as something that's going to help me be pro more productive, now I embrace it. Now, I again, I don't go crazy and like, all right, I'll get to the work later. It's more of, hey, look, I've been working my butt off. You know what? I'm feeling a little exhausted. Let me time out. Let me do something that is going to bring me joy, that is going to power me back up so that I can get back and do the work. Nice. I love that. I, I love that. And just like Super Mario, right? We need those little power ups to get us going, right? We There we go, right? So we got to have those. Uh, hopefully, you know, we're not taking too many magic mushrooms during the day, but if you do, well, you know, we're not judging that, but, uh, sometimes it's just a little star and sometimes it's a mushroom or sometimes it's something playful. So Gary, just playing that sound effect, right. Gives me a little, little boost there. Is that one of these playful rebellion things that we can do? Yes. And so, so you said playful rebellion. A lot of people say, why do we need to rebel? Well, uh, we are not re we are rebelling against the status quo. We're rebelling against that impulse that is holding us back. Because um, what I would tell people about play, and I would say, hey, look, it can just be something really tiny. In the moment, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, I love it. And then I would get emails after emails like the week later. Gary, I don't I don't know what happened. Like I went back to work, and and it, it whatever whatever you gave us in that moment, like it wore off. And I said. And I was like, and I, it happened over and over again. I was like, oh yeah, that's our conditioning. And so um, it can be something as tiny as like a, a little sound effect. Again, when stuff like that happens, we get a, boast, a burst of dopamine. We get endorphins. Those are the neurochemicals that are going to help us be creative, help us be productive, get us in that, that state of mind where we can be, um, you know, more in tune and endowed in rather than we have to like see the world as a proving ground. Like we have to prove ourselves. No. I say, let's see the world as a playground. And you and I are, are playmates and we're co-creating in this sandbox that you call, uh, you know, this live stream. And yeah, it's awesome. That is awesome. That is awesome. Well, my friend Mia Voss ha says, this is a much needed talking. And Gary, I got to tell you, man, right before the holidays here, 
now I, I'm power, p- trying to power down, man. So I love the power up, right? That'll help me get through my day and make it a little more fun. But you also talk about in this wonderful uh, book of yours, you also talk about powering down, which I yes. think is super important. So, so hit me with that, man. Power down. Talk to me about that. Yeah. And so I always say, you know, we need to be intuitive, um, get back to our like sort of our roots and stuff like that and figure out what does our body needs. Um, you know, let's not let other people dictate that for us. We should dictate that for ourselves. And you're right. Like after a long day, um, I don't know about you, but a lot of times I can't turn off this brain. Like it's like, it's thinking about all the stuff that I need to do tomorrow, emails and all that stuff. And so, um, I'm like, Oh, what is something that I can do to like, like sort of Zen, you know, decompress, um, you know, and, and play is something that is very personal. Um, and so all of these things, you know, I know what works for me, but I invite people to explore and figure out what works for them. What is something that you can do that can turn off your brain for a moment? Um, uh, because guess what? Your brain's going to be working on that anyway. Your unconscious mind is working on those, on all those challenges. Don't force it. But what is something that can just take you away uh, from that, get you grounded. Um, and so it can be as simple as meditation. Uh, for me, um, you know, as you notice with my you know, sound effects, I, I, I'm a video game player. Um, and so sometimes it is, you know, after a long day, you know, and this is the intentionality to say, you know what, I'm going to allow myself to, you know, uh, play Super Smash Brothers for the next 30 minutes, because it's going to help me just let the day go. And so, you know, what is that? What is that for you? Is it is it reading a book? You know, uh, was it a, a fiction book? You know, get lost in Narnia or something like that. You know, and maybe it is, maybe it is some mushrooms. I don't know. To each his own. <laughs> yeah, no judgment on this podcast, right? No, no judgment at all here. Stacy Stacy Baker says, right, creatively express yourself, channel in a nonverbal way to help you relax. Though I would say. Maybe singing is your jam. So maybe a verbal way might right. help you, but whatever works for you. So Stacy, whatever's working for you, right? Do it, make it so, be intentional about it. Offer maybe some meditation, some breath work, some music, some memes, love that too. Now, Gary, you mentioned the video games and I got to ask, man, do you have a classic video game that you love to play? Cause I'm a bit of a pinball wizard, but a lot of people don't know, man. I still love the classic game. So you got a classic game you love, man? All right, so if we're going like back, back, like you know, let's let's roll back the clock. Um, I I, I played multiple pinball games uh, growing up, like you know, back when we had arcades, like where there was like rooms yeah. of, of like. Um, but most most of the time, I remember going to Pizza Hut, you know, as a fan, like actually sitting at a Pizza Hut, you know, a dine in with those like stained glass uh, little uh, chandelier uh, lamps yeah. and whatnot waiting for a pizza and playing Galaga. Mm, that's right. Galaga. Yeah. Beautiful game. Love that. I, I liked uh, all the invader games, right? Space invaders, Galaga, Galaxian. And let's not forget the one that most overlooked Gorf. Do you remember <laughs> Gorf? <laughs> oh, oh, is that weird going back? Oh my God. Yeah, all brother. Right. right. So yeah. But I will tell you though, some of my favorite games were the digging games. So dig Dug. Yep. And then my all time favorite, Mr. Do. Did you play Mr. Do? No, I have not. Please enlighten me. So imagine Dig Dug, except you're like a little little clown guy chasing monsters around. If you can get all the monsters, you can push them all down with apples. And then to, and then you smash them with that, right? You smash them with that. Instead of shooting fire at them, you do that. And then you've got a little ball that you can shoot them with. But the key, spell extra to get an extra guy. Or if you drop an apple, sometimes it'll shred and you'll get, uh, it'll split open and you'll get a diamond for a free game. Good Ooh. times. Oh my God. So, so I have to ask you, I have to ask you, I, I, I ask people this all the time. All right. So take that game, take that game. Um, yeah. And you probably played hours and hours. Um, and yeah. one of the benefits of play, play actually makes us smarter. What do you think, what skills do you think you were developing from playing that game? Hmm. Well, you know, patience for sure, because I had to wait for the guys to, you know, to kind of change colors a little bit. So it was a little Pac-Man-ish. Right. Yeah. I had to wait for them to change color. So patience for sure. Strategy. 
naturally, right? You had to figure out strategy. And then you had to figure, I, I think that I also developed uh, the willingness to share because I played two players with my brother. So I'd give Paul the controller sometimes, right? Because he'd play and he would go, right? We'd go back and forth. Um, and so that was fun as well as I would argue delayed gratification, which is something I'm still not really good at. I'm, I'm you know, I wasn't then. I'm probably less good now to be, if I'm honest with you, Gary. But yeah, those are some of the skills that I think I learned. Oh, I love it. I, again, you know, like I said, at the beginning, at the top of the show, most people see play as like, oh, you know, frivolous and whatnot. But the reality is when you are in a playful state, when you are engaged in play, especially in an intentional way, you're you're growing. You're growing your mind. Yeah, absolutely. That that totally makes sense. And it's so often overlooked, right? When we're having fun, when we're playing, we're more open, right? Our brain opens up and we're able to accept more. And I would say, you know, that neuroplasticity that so many want, we need more of that, not less of that. So we need to play more, right? And you get it faster. There's a researcher, her name is Karen Previs, um, and she was working with kids. Um, and um, actually, you know, rest in peace, Karen, she, she died before she got a chance to finish her research. But she was, um, what she was saying in her research is that uh, with kids, they can learn, I think it was like three to four times faster with play than without it, because it takes about 420 repetitions to create a new neural pathway. But if you have play, you can shortcut that and you can get it there in about 20. Wow. Wow. That's awesome, man. That's so encouraging, right? So I try to do that. You know, I'm a sales trainer, right? So I help people learn the tool. I And I try to make it as fun as I can, right? I DJ at the beginning of each of our sessions, right? Try to make that fun. We play kazoo games to try to, you know, try and reinforce learning. And absolutely, man, it's so much, A, it's more enjoyable, but B, you just gave me some science good stuff, right? That, that says we should make sure we do that. So I like that, Gary. That's, yeah. that's awesome, man. Great and research. Can, great there. Yeah. And another thing too, because you're a very playful person, I can only imagine that your trainings and your sessions are like, you know, not only do you have like all the DJ and stuff, but like, it's very interactive. Uh, and that's yep. one, what, uh, another thing. So if I can drop another knowledge bomb on you, if you learn something, if you don't do anything with it, with, uh, within 14 days, it will be as if you didn't learn it. And most of us, again, think about cramming for a test, right? Like we're like, Oh my God, we're waiting to the last minute. And you're just cramming the information. Yes. It is there in your brain. You pass the test, but what happens is your brain's like, all right, we didn't do anything with it. <sighs> Gone. Dumps it. If you've seen inside out, uh, you know, uh, where they sort of dump yep. all those things. You're like, Oh, we don't need oh, that. Yeah. Uh, that's what happens. That's me in, in three and a half years uh, of French in high school. So, uh, but getting to my point is that when you are doing it through play, through playful means, you know, whether it's role playing or, or whatnot, you're doing more than just like, you know, someone talking and you're taking notes, you're actually engaging in the material. And as a result, you're going to be more likely to retain it and use it when you need to. So that's why, uh, you know, give you a shout out. That's why people need to hire you. Because the people who work with you are going to be more likely to actually use the material than if they were to go and Google it and just read it. So shout out to you right there, Phil. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Well, I appreciate that, man. So so let's um, let's talk more a little bit more of the goodies in your book because yeah. we could go about all this research too, man. But I want to talk about you. So I get to chapter three here, The Playful Rebels. And I have to tell you, Gary, I'm reading through this and I'm going to flip through it right here, you know following your compass of joy, which I want to talk about in just a minute. But before we do, right, I want to talk about these different these different rebels, right? Because I'm yes. looking through and I'm like, man, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I fit any of those. I really don't, you know, because I'm playful, right? I, I don't know. So so let's start, right? Yeah, please. Compass of joy. What, what is this? What All is right. this compass of joy? Because it sounds like a really good duo. Yeah, so this is one of the things. If you want to like get in the zone, uh, most of the time, like I said earlier, we are probably conditioned to like turn that down, <laughs> like dial that down. Uh, however, when you're in a state of joy, you are, uh, in my opinion, firing on all cylinders, and you're accessing all of those neurochemicals. So, uh, what I invite people to do, especially if they're like, you know what, you know, I'm not motivated and whatnot, I'm like, all right, what is something that is going to, you know, in the words of Marie Kondo, spark joy. You know, what is it? And again, it's a very personal thing. And if you can sort of tap into that, 
um, you know, that is going to be something that can guide you, especially when, you know, uh, when you're like, all right, cool, I got I, I to gotta get into the work. All right, cool. All right, you know what? You know, this is where we're like thinking about our why and stuff like that. It's like, all right, cool. How can I make the work that I'm doing like more, quote unquote, enjoyable? And I'll give you a quick story. Um, I was um, – there's a movie theater uh, near our house and there's this gentleman. And I, I think I talk about this in the book. His name is RB. And I would see him, uh, you know, every time I go there, man, he is just so upbeat. He is talkative. Um, and it just puts a smile on my face. And I was curious. I'm like, dude, RB, like, seriously, what, what are you on? How, how do I get some of this? But he basically, you know, he's a retired uh, gentleman. And, and he was like, I, I love people. I love talking to people. And so in the, he's doing the exact same job that, you know, the, the teenage ticket taker, like, hates his job. Uh, you know, they're doing the exact same job, but RB is enjoying it where the other person isn't because he is, again, following his compass of joy. He is seeing how this remedial job is aligned with something that brings him so much passion. And he's connecting the two. And boom, you know, that job, you know, becomes, you know, something that, you know, hey, it's going by fast. So th that's the compass of joy. Like, you know, it's something deep in you that, you know, what is something that's going to bring you joy and, and, and passion? Love that. Love that. So we had a guy back in Milwaukee that often was my, uh, my ticket taker guy. His name was Spider. Spider loved the movies. Like he would tell you. So you're going to see this one? I, I don't know. You might want to consider this one because this one's only six. But this one over here is eight and a half. But I'm telling you, you'll still love it if you like this, right? And I'm like, man, I love this guy. You know, he totally right? digs his job. He's super into it, right? And and that totally makes a difference, right? We get more enjoyment out of others when we are open to, to kind of receiving their joy, right? Yes. Cool. Cool, man. Cool. Well, well, in your in your chapter about activating power-ups and celebrations, I see these seven or nine different uh, ones here. And I'm like, Joker, eh, not really me, right? I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't do any practical jokes. You did. I read about your <laughs> April Fool's Day. That's cool, right? The Kinect lead, right? I'm like, eh, okay. I don't do yoga or any of, okay. Explore, no. Competitor, not as much anymore. Director, collector, artist, creator, storyteller. Yeah, sometimes. But I'm grateful that you put in the connector because I have to tell you, that is where I get my greatest joy, right? That's why I do this podcast, man. I love to connect with great people like you who have great energy. And shout out to our friend, Kathy Coates Guest, who connected us up, right? Because I love that. So so which one would you say that you are, Gary? Yeah. And so with that, uh, yeah, is one of those things where just like glasses – we could try a few on. We could see which one fits. Uh, growing up, I yeah. my play personality was definitely the Joker. You know, as I mentioned in the book, April Fool's Day was one of my favorite holidays. Uh, and my sisters are still uh, talking about the trauma that I inflicted on them. Um, <laughs> however, um, as I got older, uh, some of the other ones, uh, the storyteller uh, is a big one for me. Um, and also the connector. Um, I get similar. I get a lot of joy of connecting with people. I love like going to like networking events and just getting to know people. And then like, I love helping other people find other people. Like I, you know, someone said, man, you're like a great matchmaker. I'm like, cool. Like, and for me, it is joy. Like I, I hear, I hear about like, Oh, are you looking for this? Oh my God. You need to talk to X, Y, and Z. Like I would be like, all right, we're, we're going to go back. Uh, like, you know, like Flavor Flay and public interview, uh, public enemy. Like he was like the hype person. I would be everyone's perfect hype person. Like I will, I will hype you up. Uh, so anyways, I'm hiring are, you. you're on. Those are my play personalities. And then for, you know, for, if you're watching this, listening to this um, and you're curious, you know, about like those, and maybe you read something, you're like, oh, that's not me, but this is interesting. Um, because it's all sort of play and play should be very interesting. Um, sometimes I tell people, Hey, try one of these on, explore it, see what happens. Um, you know, and, and, and maybe it might be something again, that's sparking joy that you had no idea, but if it does, if you don't like it, all right, cool. Try something else on. Oh, uh, well, so that's interesting. You say that because as I was going through that, right, I'm looking for identification and I, I would say sometimes on some of those, right? But never, nothing except connector all the time. But I love that that you've kind of given me permission, not that I needed it, but I'll take it, uh, to try them on and, and to take them off 
as they're not needed because I do like to story tell. I sometimes do like to be, you know, other ones. And that, that actually, um, you know, that, that's, a, a, you know, a shot of dopamine for me to say, dude, you don't have to be any of these all the time. You can use them as you need them. And so I thank you, Gary. That's beautiful, man. Yeah. Can I tell you another story about that of how someone yeah, please. Uh, got benefit from that? So uh, this yeah. was uh, during the pandemic, um, you know, someone that I was working with, uh, their sort of dominant play personality was the Explorer. They they love traveling. Um, and, you know, as you know, most people like, you know, during the pandemic, we couldn't travel. So they were going through, um, you know, some withdrawals um, and they were like really stuck. And they were like, like, I, I, I don't get it. Like what, you know, what do I do, Gary? Like, they saw it as like the one and the one and done. They like my dominant play personality is shuttered. I have nothing. And so what we did, um, I learned this from uh, Dr. Stuart Brown. He wrote the book on play, but he talks about taking a play history. And what that means is just exploring your past. And what were the things that you did when you were younger and how can you remix it now that you're older? And so, you know, we were talking and she was talking about some of the stuff that she loved to do. And you know, when you hit it, when they're reminiscing and you see like a little smile on their face, like, ah, ah, I think we got something. And she would talk about like when she was younger, she used to like, you know, collect dolls and she used to like play with them. And, and, you know, it was, it was fun. And she's like, no, 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 Gary. Like, I'm not about to go to, you know, toy store and, and buy some Barbies. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm not saying you have to, but let's dig deeper. Let's unpack this. What are you, what is the essence of this, of this thing? All right. So we have collecting and we have uh, what she described as nurturing. Um, and so then I'm like, all right, what is something else that you could collect in potential nurture since you can't travel? And, you know, after some brainstorming, um, she's decided on succulents. And that was something that like, it, it sparked her curiosity she was curious about it. And she was like, I don't think I can kill these. <laughs> um, and so she started with like two or three uh, varieties. And then because she got curious, she like started to dive into it. And then, and then she learned about them. Uh, she started uh, propagating, creating her own sort of mixtures of them. Um, and then um, like when I checked back in with her, like, uh, like six months later, I think she had like 45 and now she has like over 200 different, like, yeah. And she's and and I don't tell people to do so a lot of times when you get something that you're really passionate about and whatnot, people are like, oh, why don't you start selling that? The problem is a lot of times that takes the joy out of it because the joy was actually doing it, not necessarily like now I need to sell myself. But people were so curious. They're like, hey, can you help me with this? So she like she was interested. So she's like, yeah, then she started she had a whole bunch and she started selling some off. That's not a recommendation. You know, to people like once you get this, it's like, oh, now I need an Etsy store. It's like, hey, if you feel called to do that, great, but don't feel like you have to. But that's again, someone that their dominant play personality, um, you know, they couldn't use it. And we sort of dug <laughs> since we were talking about digging and we discovered uh, something else. Yeah. Dig in, dig dug, and <laughs> digging succulents. I love it, Gary. That's a, that's a connection there. I love that, brother. I love that. So, so with that, you know, your book had lots of fun stuff. So one of the things that I love are these play rebel missions, right? And number five really stuck with me, and it kind of goes off what we just talked about, and that is the seven most influential people exercise. So, can we step through this one here because yes. this is a really fun one, and I think this will be a good example for folks that are like maybe on the fence, like, should I get this book? Should I not get the damn book? Okay, Gary, let's go, man. Let's yeah. do this so one. Yeah. So with this, um, you know, it, it came to me when um, I heard this all the time, like you are the average of the, you know, five to seven people that you, you know, um, you know, stick around with. And I was like, oh, all right, cool. And and I was like, I was, you know, really looking and I was like, yeah, I'd spend time with this person. And I was like, wow, that we influence each other. However, if you're not intentional, <laughs> those five to seven people might not influence you in the right way. You can find yourself sort of going off a cliff and whatnot. And so uh, with this mission, um, I was like, wow, you know, if you have the right people in your environment, anything's possible. Um, and so I invite people, you know, to just start to make a list. Who are those five to seven people that you spend the most time with? And, and then I start to ask them, you know, to like sort of, you know, create a chart and then, then start to document like, all right, what's the energy? that they bring, you know, to uh, the equation. Uh, what is something that you potentially could 
ask them, you know, um, you know, that you haven't asked them. And the whole point here is that, you know, we do things for people that we like. And so, you know, hey, how and this is something, you know, you can be an introvert and do this. You don't have this is not just for extroverts, because um, I have this belief that, you know, it takes a village and the people that are in your circle, they they want to help you. And matter of fact, you know, sometimes it gives them more joy helping you than you get in, you know, in in receiving it. So it's it's more about and especially if they can use their superpowers. So it, it's a really fun, really fun activity. Um, and it allows you to really explore your network and then potentially see where's there a gap. And then this is a challenge, too. Uh, you know, playfulness is is about connecting. It's about like finding people, um, you know, to to bring you to the circle. So if there's like, you know, you're, you know, it's a perfect time to do something like this because we're embarking on a new year. This is usually where people, you know, set new goals. And if you see a gap of like, uh, like for example, uh, for me when I was writing this book, um, it was around the time like I did this activity. And I was like, oh, you know what? I could definitely use some people in my circle that know a little bit about this because I don't. And then I started asking around. Um, and then, you know, I, you know, was very fortunate. Uh, that's, um, you know, how I got connected, um, really got connected to, uh, she's now my assistant, Hannah. And so, Hannah, if you're watching, what's up? Um, because she is amazing, um, you know, at uh, promotions and stuff like that. That's not necessarily my superpower. And boom, you know, now she's in the circle. Now she's like, she's in the corral. She's in the hood. She's, she's part of the family, if you will. That's beautiful, man. I love that. I love that. And the interconnectedness and finding those gaps, I think is, is probably the most powerful part about that because often we hang out with people just like us. Yes. And that doesn't help us grow. That just makes us fat and comfortable. So I'm fat, probably not as comfortable as I'd like to be, but I'm working on that. So anyway, right. So I love the idea of finding those gaps and filling those in and, and then making other connections, right? Because that strengthens us all. That gets us all stronger, man. So that's that's really, really awesome. There's, wow. So yeah, just that chapter alone in this book and that exercise certainly makes the book worth the investment. All of it's really good, but I got, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, there's some crap that gets in our way, man. You call these barriers to play in chapter eight here. So talk to me about some of these barriers, a couple of them maybe, and then how we can overcome them. Yes. So, uh, you know, I didn't want it to be like, yeah, you know here play and and then because again and when i was starting off on this journey and i was super excited about it i would get you know i would invite people to do stuff and then they're like oh no like and so over time i'm realizing that just because you know about play and and maybe you know about the benefits you it's kind of hard to get into that playful state and one of the big ones for 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 adults is uh being a perfectionist um if you're trying to be a perfectionist you can't be in the playful state because play is messy. <laughs> when you're in a playful state, you're going to make mistakes. Again, thinking about video games. Um, you know, it took me, you know, months to master a video game. I would like, oh, I died. Like, all right, cool. So if I wanted to be perfect and I started playing a video game and I died, well, that's not being perfect. And so if you're if you're just that person that has to be good at everything when you start, you're not gonna want to play. You're gonna be like, mm. and again. Um, I'm, I, yes, I am the play guy. I know a lot about this. It still gets in my way. So it's, it's one thing to remind myself, especially when I'm feeling this barrier of like, man, why am I having such a challenge to get into this fun story? Uh, I was at a white elephant, uh, party, um, and, um, you know, we we're building, um, uh, those, uh, gingerbread houses and it's not something that I'm, I'm naturally good at. And again, if you think about it, it's like, or if you only do it once a year, like, you know, how can you like get good at something like that? That's like only going to the gym, like, you know, once a year, like, Oh, well, I'm not, where's that six pack. So anywho. Um, and so I was, you know, getting frustrated and uh, a good friend of mine who was, you know, uh, next to me, she also getting frustrated. Like, and then we have, so to make matters worse, comparison's another barrier to play a good friend of mine. She won master chef. She is, and she, she is a baker. She is over here effortlessly painting this gingerbread house. It like is immaculate, beautiful. Wow. So I was not like again allowing myself to have fun. I like because I'm comparing. I'm trying to be a perfectionist. And both of us, once we said, you know what, let's just have fun. Like you know, and it was just something. Boom! In that moment, it clicked, and we embraced imperfection, and we just allowed ourselves to just get in the moment. And yeah, we finished it. 
<laughs> we finished the task at hand and no, it's not something that deserves to be in the Louvre. But again, we had fun. We enjoyed doing it and we were playful. Wow. Yeah. That's that comparison being the thief of joy, man, that one gets in my way sometimes. So it's a good reminder to strip that crap away and just have some fun. Now with that, I, I want to be really clear here. You're talking in the book about being more childlike not be more childish. Yes. And I think that's an important distinction, right? So so walk us through that for those that are saying, well, that's fun, Gary, but I just don't have time or I, I can't be I, I can't be a kid all the time. Talk to me about childlike versus childish because I think that's important. Yes. So um, again, if we have this perception that play is just a waste of time, it's frivolous. Um, and, and a lot of times, oh, you're being, you're, you're being a kid. I'm like, yeah, I'm being a kid. But think about like, if you really look at kids in their essence, they're the perfect models for this. And when I mean be childlike, not childish, childlike is being curious, <laughs> you know, being open to discovery, uh, you know, using your imagination. Um, you know, this is where creativity comes from. All of those things, I don't know about you, but I feel like this is necessary to be good at what we do, to be, you know, a full, uh, real, well-rounded human being. Uh, but the childish behavior, yes, we can we can let go of those. That's the being stingy, you know, being selfish, like all of those uh, things. Um, and again, if you have uh, kids or you've been around kids, you probably experience those. And yes, those aren't the qualities that I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about the qualities that are going to actually help us uh, thrive. Awesome. Love that. Love that distinction. So Gary, as we kind of take us home here, man. How do we get started on this journey towards our own playful rebellion? Obviously, we should get the book. I want to be really clear. Get the book, right? But what else? If we people want to get started today, Gary, because the book will come in two days, probably after yeah. Christmas. So take us through one thing that we can do to, to get started on the journey. Yeah. The first thing. you, you want to. <laughs> I like to say, try it before you buy it. Uh, and the easiest thing. And it's, it's so awesome because play fills us with joy and, and stuff like that. And we want to do more of it. It's very pleasurable. Uh, think about what is something that you probably did when you were younger that you're probably not doing now. Um, you know, you know, go back, you know, probably something that you did before 13, before puberty and awkwardness and stuff like that. Uh, and then think about how you can incorporate it into your day to day um, and start small. Now, you might have to remix it. Like I told you in the story before, you know, you might not be like into like, all right, let me just go get a doll or something like that. You might have to be creative. Um, and then so that's the first thing. So go and, you know, discover once you have something now as a way to actually incorporate it into your life. Um, I learned this from researcher uh, BJ Fogg. Um, he wrote the book Tiny Habits. It's think about um, it's, it's a recipe, you know, after or before I do blank, I will do x so what is that playful activity because it will make me feel blank you know it will make me feel whole or rested or more productive or whatever it is and that is your trigger so that you know how to incorporate it and on top of that put it in your calendar because i don't know about you if it's not in my calendar it's not happening it can be five minutes Same. it can be five minutes it doesn't have to be like hours and stuff like that it can be five minutes put into your calendar um and then after you do it celebrate yourself because you will get the endorphins, you will get um, all of those feel good hormones that will make you want to do it again. And um, tell me, you know, your life isn't better. Um, so that's the other thing, like, be mindful about like, yeah, after I do those things, you know, after I played with those Legos, and I went back to work. It actually, yeah, I, I was being productive because our brains are have we have a negativity bias, which means that neg things that have uh, negativity sticks to us like Velcro. I bet you we can all think back of a time we felt humiliated and stuff like that. But it's a bit more challenging to recall the positive things because positivity flows right off of us just like Teflon. Uh, you know, you wear that that Teflon rain jacket and the rain just slides right off. That's how positivity is. And it takes us actually being intentional and actually remembering, yes, that was good. That did feel good for it to start to stick. So find out what the thing is, get it in your calendar, and then afterwards, reflect, how did it make you feel? Is it helping you be more productive? That's 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 the way to get into it. And then when the book comes, then you'll get the play guide and you'll be able to um, crush 2023. Or any other year too, right? Depending on when people hear this, 
Hey, but friends, you want to get to know my friend Gary Ware more? Go to BreakthroughPlay.com. Get a copy of Playful Rebellion. It's a simple but powerful read that will encourage you to be more childlike, not childish, and incorporate a little bit of play in each and every day that you have. Gary, I'm so glad we got to hang out today, man. You're fantastic. Thanks, brother. Yeah, Phil. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and thanks to all our viewers and our listeners here. We got lots of great comments here. I'm going to close with Andrew's thought here. Interesting how the fail fast and quickly management style generated from the arcade generation of insert another quarter and try again. Keep going, friends. Put another quarter in the jukebox, baby. No, that's not it. But have a great time and do a little bit of play every day.